In the 1970s and 1980s, something truly remarkable was happening in the world of rock and roll. It was a time when bands like REO Speedwagon ruled the music scene, and at the heart of their sound was the legendary Gary Rich Rath. With a crown of curls that practically begged for the spotlight, he embodied the essence of a rock guitar god. As the lead guitarist of REO Speedwagon for almost two decades, he was the driving force behind their meteoric rise to fame, penning chart-topping hits like Can't Fight This Feelin' and Keep On Lovin' You. However, every rise has its fall, and the journey back down was a challenging one, especially for Gary. What led to the demise of this iconic band? And what trials did Gary face along the way? Join us as we dive into the thrilling tale of their rise and fall. A story filled with excitement, intrigue, and mystery. Let's begin. Imagine the thrill of climbing to the very top of the music world alongside your fellow bandmates. You've poured your heart and soul into your music for years, and it finally pays off. But then, in the blink of an eye, things change. The world you once ruled starts to slip away, and you're left looking up at it from below. This realization can be incredibly tough to accept, and Gary Richrath, just like his bandmates, faced this challenge in his own way. Gary's story is like that of a small town boy who chased his rock and roll dreams and became a star. But here's the twist. It didn't end as perfectly as one might hope. Maybe he never thought about how it would end, or perhaps he didn't want to dwell on it. But there was a time when Gary was the rock star, especially in the Midwest. He wasn't just the face of REO Speedwagon, he played a massive role in shaping the band's music, writing some of their most famous songs, and being a guiding force both on and off the stage during the 70s and 80s. But as the 80s rolled on, everything started to change. The band members were getting older, and the world of rock and roll was shifting. Gary seemed to struggle more than most with these changes, making it a challenging time for him. Now, let's rewind to 1970. Back then, Gary was the missing piece that keyboardist Neil Doughty and drummer Alan Gratzer needed for their band. At that point, they were just a cover band playing other people's songs. But when they heard Gary play, they were blown away by his guitar skills and rock star looks. Gary wanted to do more than just play covers. He wanted to create original music, and he wanted to be part of their band as much as they wanted him. Over the years, the band saw some changes. Kevin Cronin briefly took over as the lead singer in 1972, and then returned for good in 1976. Bruce Hall joined as the bassist in 1977, taking over from Greg Philbin. Now, while it's unclear why they made this change, it could have been due to musical preferences or perhaps personality dynamics. But one thing was certain, Bruce Hall was in and he played a crucial role in the band. Their big break came with the release of You Can Tune a Piano But You Can't Tune a Fish in 1978. This album marked the beginning of a successful run for REO Speedwagon, with the lineup staying pretty consistent for almost 12 years. Their crowning achievement came with High Fidelity in 1980. The album soared to the top of the charts in the United States, selling over 10 million copies and delivering six hit singles. And then, just as things were taken off, MTV burst onto the scene. This new music channel played REO Speedwagon's videos within its first 24 hours, adding another layer to their success. As the story goes, in that very same week, REO Speedwagon played a sold-out show in Denver, Colorado, marking another milestone. They became the first band to have a live stereo concert broadcast on MTV. This was a significant moment, because up until then, their rock and roll fame was largely confined to the Midwest. But now, rock fans from New York to Los Angeles knew who REO Speedwagon was. The band was soaring high. Yet here's the twist. Reaching the top is challenging, but staying there is a whole different ballgame. Gary Richrath and Kevin Cronin had found their groove when it came to songwriting. They were an unusual pair with distinct styles, but together they created magic. Their High Infidelity album was a testament to this partnership, with two standout singles, Take It On The Run and Keep On Loving You. These songs walked a fine line between pop and rock. If you stripped away Gary's guitar, they'd lean more towards the pop side of music. For their follow-up album after High Infidelity, titled Good Trouble, they tilted the scale back toward rock a bit. Naturally, though, it was challenging to replicate the phenomenal success of High Infidelity. Then came the album Wheels Are Turning in 84, which did slightly better but still fell short. 
Looking back, it is worth noting that REO Speedwagon released an album every year from 1971 to 1980. However, after High Infidelity, it took them four years to release Good Trouble and Wheels Are Turning in 84. It would be another three years before they dropped their final album with all five original members, Life As We Know It, in 87. During this time, album sales were declining rapidly, and the music scene was evolving, leaving them somewhat behind, especially if they wanted to stick to their rock and roll roots, which by all means Gary Richrath did. Then, around the end of 1988, a pivotal moment occurred. Alan Gratzer, the drummer and a founding member, decided it was time to step away from the band. After 21 years of rock and roll, he chose to go home, spend time with his family, and embark on a new chapter in his life. We started out just to have fun, but it took over our lives, he said. We made 16 albums and sold 40 million copies and got to see the world. Alan was 40 years old at the time when he made this life-altering decision. While Bruce Hall, the bassist, Neil Dowdy, the keyboardist and another founding member, and singer Kevin Cronin took the news relatively well, it was a different story for Gary Richrath. He was entirely unprepared for Alan's departure and had the most emotional reaction to this significant change in the band's lineup. Alan shared a heartfelt moment with Gary when he made the decision to leave the band. They hugged tightly, unable to hold back tears. After all, they had been together for so long, and this parting was exceptionally tough. Kevin Cronin later admitted that he had no idea at the time just how deeply and on how many levels Alan's departure would affect the group. What's interesting is that Alan didn't simply leave the band. He retired from music altogether. He shifted his focus to being a father and a husband, and even ventured into the restaurant business. Meanwhile, the other four band members were determined to continue making music. However, it became clear that REO Speedwagon's run had reached its conclusion. The rock music landscape had evolved significantly by the time Gary left in 1990. Some of the top-selling albums at that time included The Black Crows' Shake Your Moneymaker, Cinderella, Heartbreak Station, and ACDC's The Razor's Edge. These albums provided a glimpse into the prevailing music trends in 1990. The problem lay in the different musical directions the remaining members wanted to explore. Gary was keen on one path, while the other three had a different vision. In retrospect, regardless of the path they chose, it seemed unlikely that REO Speedwagon could have saved themselves. The music they had written with Gary and Kevin was perfect for its time, but as with many bands, there comes a point when the musical landscape shifts and the magic of the past is hard to replicate. Gary decided to move on, putting together his own band and playing gigs. Meanwhile, Kevin, Neil, and Bruce sought replacements for Alan and Gary, recorded a new album, but sadly it didn't perform well. Epic Records dropped them from the label after almost two decades of partnership. It is worth mentioning that Gary later released his own album, but it didn't fare much better than the one released by the remaining members of REO Speedwagon. While Gary and his band, Rich Rath, played in bars and opened for shows around the Midwest, the glory days of REO Speedwagon were behind them. It was a far cry from their previous rock star status, but Gary gave it his all, and those who watched him perform in those smaller venues could see his dedication and passion. Kevin, Neil, and Bruce continued under the REO Speedwagon name, touring and playing their old hits. They essentially became a tribute band for their own music, drawing in crowds with their classic tunes. There was even talk of a reunion tour down the road, but it never materialized. Alan found happiness in his retirement, while Gary, despite his desire to continue, couldn't let go of the past. He struggled with the breakup and the transition from the pinnacle of rock stardom to a different phase in his life. Sometimes even rock stars need to know when it's time to move on and take care of themselves. Gary's journey serves as a reminder that accepting change and moving forward can be the hardest part, especially after experiencing such a monumental peak in one's career. Now, as we wrap up this journey through the rise and changes in REO Speedwagon's story, we have a question for you. What do you think it takes for a band to gracefully transition through changing musical landscapes and continue to stay relevant? Share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe for more content. And as always, thank you for watching.